All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining the September 18th version of our open forum for the Better Investing Online chapter. We are very excited today to have a special guest with us, and I'll tell you more about that. But first, I want to let you know that if we do talk about any specific stocks today, that is just for informational purposes. We're not recommending that you run out and buy those stocks, although you can, but please do your own research first because that's part of the fun of being in better investing. <clears throat> also, we are recording this and it is going also going live on Facebook. It's going to be available on our YouTube channel. So if you are in witness protection, if you're on the lam, if you don't want anybody to know that you're here, please leave your video off and you can rename yourself to something a little more um, a little more secretive <laughs> or covert. And also if you want to notify, if you want to, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking well today. If you want to enable captions, closed captions, you can do that yourself in your bottom toolbar. And if you need help with that, you can send me a private chat and I will help you to get that done. And now I'm going to turn it over to Phil, who's going to introduce our special guest, Matt Spielman. Phil Suter, one of our Oh, so that's, sorry, this is the Education Committee. Sri Ram Matabushi, Phil Suter, and myself are the members at the moment. We are looking for more volunteers, so come on down and join us. We put together these events on the odd, on every odd month on the third Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern time. And that's what tonight is. Tonight's an odd month. I mean, tonight is the third Wednesday of an odd month, so here we are. And now I will turn it over to Phil to introduce Matt. Thanks. Brilliant. Bring it on, Phil. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Matt Spielman. He's a lifetime member of Better Investing, the vice president for club development for the Houston chapter, and the president of the Houston Model Club. He was the founding secretary for the BI Baker Model Investment Club in the mid-Michigan chapter. He's been an avid investor in individual stocks for 24 years. Matt retired in 2020 after a 27 year career in the automotive industry in engineering and information technology, capping his career with a two year assignment in Israel. Ireland. Since that, since that time, he's been exploring his new home state of Texas, as well as the rest of the US. Thanks very much for being us, with us tonight, Matt, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Phil, and, and thank you, Chris and Shriram, for the invitation. Uh, as I was mentioning before the recording, um, this is uh, sort of the second generation of, of my presentation into the psychology of investing. Uh, the first, uh, first time I presented it actually was at Bink uh, this past May. It was sort of a monolithic uh, introduction to the topic. Um, trying to just uh, lay down a basis for everything. And it was uh, great fun. And I learned that there are a lot of different forums that people want to learn in that. So um, this is sort of my first attempt to, to it's still a pretty big bite. It's still a, a good half hour, but uh, try and get, uh, get this into uh, bite-sized pieces that can be uh, more independent or follow more naturally along as people, uh, people are curious or people research. So hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, it is version 1.0, uh, oh, uh, and I will mention the the other presentation. I did actually just reprise it for the Oregon chapter's annual meeting this past Saturday. So uh, if you didn't attend Bink or don't have the recordings, uh, they did record it, and it should be posted. You can try that for free if you enjoy this. Uh, Chris mentioned this earlier, but I'll throw it up to uh, the standard disclaimer. I, I, I won't in any slides mention any stocks. I will mention some data sources, specifically books. Uh, none, of, none, of, none of the things I say are recommendations of, of the organization or anyone else, uh, but I'm happy if you're curious about them. Please uh, do your own research. So let's talk about our performance as investors. So Better Investing's goal is to outperform the market by 5% per year. But what do you need to do to outperform that? Obviously, the organization has tools, and, and there are lots of things you need to learn from tools. But I, I believe that there are sort of three basic attributes to be a successful in, investor in individual stocks. I think you need to, first of all, enjoy the endeavor, right? This is not just investing for 30 or 40 years during your career for your retirement. Hope you, hopefully you have a good long retirement and you have an additional 20 or 30 years to go. So as a 60 year endeavor, 
um, if it's a chore, if it's unpleasant in, in, I'll say in any way or overall, you're probably not going to stick with it. Um, secondly is you need to devote enough time to be successful. I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, it's a lot easier to do after retirement. Um, and so, you know, you can pace yourself as well. If you're, if you're just starting out, um, if you're still working and have a, a, a successful professional career or, or one that takes a lot of your time, um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing either, right? Uh, you don't need a full portfolio of stocks. You can get your diversification from indexing and uh, buy a few stocks or even just one stock while you're learning, um, while it interests you, uh, and while you are building your skills into uh, a full-on portfolio. And then the third thing, and I'll say uh, Ken Kavula uh, had some feedback with me on first. The first thing I said, you just need, you need the discipline to, to get through the tough times, right? You don't want to sell in March of 2009 or in uh, March of 2020, right? Uh, you need to be able to go through there. And, and um, Ken said, you know, I don't know if it's all discipline. I think some people are blessed with the optimism that it isn't quite so hard an effort. Uh, but the, the way to stick through it, uh, there will inevitably be tough times. There will be more in the future. Uh, and that's where a, a lot of the difference can be made about uh, really um, so you're not making emotional mistakes in that time. So uh, if you if you don't think you can do that or if your measures say it's not good, the, the honest truth would be you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of heartache to buy an index. And that's hard to say and we don't say it a lot. And I don't I don't wish that for anyone. Uh, if I, I wish that uh, you find whatever brings you the best success. Um, but we need to think about that as sort of uh, um, uh, a hurdle we have to have, right? Uh, we should be outperforming it to justify all this time and energy we're putting into this endeavor. So how do we do that? Well, how do you know that you're, that you're successful? Um, obviously, our, our first exposure to this kind of thing is the grading scales we all see in school. Uh, I have a basic elementary uh, straight line A through F letter grade in there. Um, but uh, while they can be uh, helpful because they have connotations, whether you get an A or you get a B or you get a D, um, it doesn't really reflect how success happens in the real world. And this was uh, part of my exploration into this topic. Um, this is a, a construct where the, the materials you're being uh, measured against are designed to this scale rather than the other way around. But in the real life, we have a, a competitive environment, right? Uh, whenever you're trading in stocks, someone's on the other side of that trade, right? If, if, if you bought, why did they sell? If, if you sold, why did they buy? Um, we're under uncertain conditions. Uh, who knew before 1.30 p.m. today, central time? Uh, what the Fed was going to do today, right? There, there was betting, and uh, a lot of people were incorrect in that. And some people um, uh, put money on those bets, and some people just had opinions. And again, as I mentioned in the last slide, this is done over a long period of time, so you get a lot of repetition. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. It isn't uh, quite that easy, um, but it certainly is very impactful. So what does uh, uh, success look like in the real world? So I have a few examples here. Um, this first person is Joel Tillinghast. He was a protege of Peter Lynch at Fidelity. Um, he was the uh, fund manager of the Fidelity Low Cost Stock Fund for 34 years. And over that time, he managed to outperform the market 3% per year. Uh, excellent work. And, and it certainly uh, made a difference for his uh, shareholders. I did hold this uh, hold this fund uh, in the 90s and uh, late 90s and early 2000s for a while. Uh, he certainly earned his uh, his fund fees. And he had a quote. His book is "Big Money Think Small." Uh, excellent book. He uses different words, but if you read the book, you'd think he was a BI member. Very compatible method. Um, and in that book, it's also, I think it is still now, it's quite often uh, on sale uh, as a Kindle deal. Uh, for, I think it was for $2.99. It might be even today. Uh, but he has a quote that says, even, even with great inflation, 55% wouldn't be a passing grade. But in the stock market, being right 55% of the time is as good as it gets. Think about that, right? Uh, uh, you know, just a little bit better than flipping a coin. Um, you may outperform the market in a particular time frame with a, a particular stock pick, uh, and uh, the other times you won't. And you have to be psychologically ready to deal with that in order to work. And so keep in mind that 55%. Uh, 
So this is not just a matter of stock investing. Uh, this is Annie Duke. Uh, Annie's uh, book, Thinking in Bets, really set me on this path. I read it two years ago, uh, and uh, it really spoke to me in a number of ways. She is a PhD psychologist who uh, took a sabbatical from her thesis on decision making and uh, embedded herself in uh, the professional poker uh, circuit. She, she became a professional player. She won a World Series of Poker. Uh, and a lifetime winnings of $5 million just in about a decade. She has finished her PhD coming out of that and does uh, a lot of um, consulting and teaching along the lines of decision-making. That's really the focus of her books. So her quote is, a great poker player has a good size advantage over the other players. So understand, she says, if you're skilled, making significantly better strategic decisions, so you're not making mistakes, will still be losing over 40% of the time at the end of eight hours of play. So eight hours of play is a number of hands. Again, that repetition that goes through. So Annie says, uh, the best you can be is 60-40. So somewhere along those lines. Now, <clears throat> this is true uh, for the house too. Uh, this is a roulette wheel, of course. Um, roulette is sort of the original random number generator. Uh, and uh, you can bet a number of ways half the population. You can bet red or black, odd or even, but there's those green spaces uh, which form the house edge. <clears throat> and so the house's odds to take your money in roulette, now Europe only has a zero instead of a double zero, but uh, in American roulette odds is 52.63%. And based on those odds over the, the volume that a, a casino can get, um, you know, they, they make a living, they make a very good living um, on the uh, aggregate performance of a small edge over time. But it's not even about money. <clears throat> we did, I uh, uh, brought some of these concepts to the uh, Manifest Investing Bull Sessions, which is on Tuesday afternoons. And we started talking about Roger Federer. And when you break down Roger's uh, uh, perhaps greatest of all time, one of the greatest of all time uh, tennis careers, you can see, you know, his 20 Grand Slam championships, his 103 tournament titles come down to a match win percent of 81%, a sets 1% of 75%, and a games 1% of 58%. A little bit more than 55, but he, he had an edge, um, certainly didn't guarantee him in the progression of any tournament that he was going to win. But that edge, time and time again, uh, made him, uh, you know, one of history's great champions. Now compare that to Andre Agassi. So Andre Agassi, also uh, one of the all-time greats, uh, eight Grand Slam championships, sixty tournament titles, seventy-six matches, seventy-one sets won, and fifty-seven point nine percent games won. Now who's better? Right. The real answer is you can't really know. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people that make arguments on both sides. Um, they did have some overlapping time in their careers, but, you know, uh, certainly the opponents they generally played were different. Even the rules of the game were different uh, as uh, as uh, automatic reading of, of uh, out conditions came in and things like that. You know, but that margin, just to go back to it, that's 57.9% of games won versus 582 right? That's a, that's a 0.3% change. That's not to say that that edge uh, is entirely the difference, uh, but... Uh, it does uh, come out in the end, in the wash, when you play, in their case, uh, 10,000 games. So what's with this 55%? What does that mean? Um, so I'm going to delve a little bit into uh, some numbers, some statistics. On the right-hand side here is a histogram, if you all remember your histograms, um, back to World War II of the uh, uh, performance of the stock market. And forgive the red and green. The red and green is about recency. It's not about performance. So there is a there is a mark. Let me mark it here. Um, right here would be uh, negative performance to the left and positive performance to the right. But we can see that there is a clear uh, uh, aggregation, or the highest level, if you will, is around that 20, 10 to twenty percent mark. And certainly over just about any long-term time you can think of, the, the long-term average of the market is about 10%. But overall, it generally, uh, uh, generally forms a bell curve. So I've overlaid sort of an idealistic bell curve on it, um, centered around that 10%. This is important because that means this is a type of data that we can analyze statistically. 
uh, and we can use certain tools to look at it. It's not a perfect match because we don't have an infinite amount of data to go through, but uh, it lines up fairly well. The other point with the graph below this, this is the 10 year analyzed annualized total return. So this is 10 years total going back to 1990. So from 1990, there has been no set of, uh, no decade, just say it that way, no set of 10 years um, that has ever gone below zero. So even though the individual years have a good tail uh, that have lost money, there is no decade. And, and, I, and again, I mean that not just in the calendar years, but in any 10 year rolling window that has actually lost money since 1990. And, and actually even, even before then, um, certainly in, if you take a 20 year snapshot, there is no uh, historical data point in time uh, that has lost money. And that's not to say uh, inflation adjusted, that doesn't say everyone is really happy with it, but you're just not below zero. So again, this edge that appears to happen on an annual basis uh, for stock returns uh, becomes even better as you aggregate those just like uh, tennis games, sets and matches. So those are examples, but uh, if we really want to look at this uh, in, a, in a holistic manner, um, we can actually take those statistical tools and uh, make a market of our own. Um, in chapter three of his book, Fooled by Randomness, Nassim Taleb uh, lays out a, a situation. He talks about a retired dentist. And so uh, his, his uh, analogy in the book is that dentistry is a uh, is a vocation that relies almost almost nothing on luck, right? It's highly skilled, highly um, highly uh, compensated, and so in essence, to him as a as a risk taker, it's kind of boring, and he puts that in contrast to investing. So he has this uh, boring investor who does very well. He earns fifteen percent, uh, so he is making the bi uh, goal. Um, but there is some uh, variation in what he does. There's a 10% error rate per year that that 15% average can vary. So uh, the way you model that statistically or put it out statistically is you say out of 100 sample uh, paths, and that's not to mean 100 years specifically, but 100 different ways that a certain year, amount of years can go, 68 of them will fall between 5% and 25%. And 95 of them will fall between minus five and 35%. Uh, I'm sure all of you can, can uh, think of years when your own personal portfolios uh, fell within those ranges. And I would say uh, that's probably even maybe uh, a little bit conservative or a little bit uh, uh, steady uh, in investment returns over a lifetime. So what would, this, uh, what would be the results of this? What does it look like? First, a graphical representation, again, kind of like the overall market. Again, our uh, theoretical investor is getting 15%, um, but he will have uh, a variation uh, of 68% of his, of his items or his uh, annual returns will be between 5 and 25%. And 95% of them will be between negative 5%. So he does lose money some years. We expect that. Um, but on the opposite side, he has some very good years. So... How does he look and how does he understand what his performance is? So these are the results. Now I'm calling success here because I'm following what Nassim said is a return greater than zero at different time scales. So uh, we certainly want to beat the market and on average he does, but we at least don't want to lose money, right? Uh, it's, it's a psychological barrier that we don't like loss. So how does he look or feel to himself? So if he looks every year on, on a yearly basis, he, is, he has a 93% chance of a positive return. Quite, quite strong, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite easy to be happy with yourself on a regular basis. If we take that down to a quarterly level, that's 77%. So just about three out of every four quarters are positive or one out of four quarters is negative. If we look down at monthly, that gets down to 67%, right? So two months out of three are positive. We get down to day, and, and I'm going to call this our friend, right? This is our friend. Uh, very close to 55 percent um uh you know on a, on a daily basis you have just a little bit over uh a, a coin flip on having a positive day or a negative day even when you are a very successful investor in aggregate and then uh, he does provide data but it goes down from there right so on the second basis it's a it's an infinitesimal uh uh advantage and hopefully no one's looking at that level so, um, you know, there's a point where 
you're looking at things, uh, however often you check the market, you feel good or you feel bad about how you're doing. Um, this is the what, but, but importantly, because we have this model, we're sort of playing God and we can actually determine or the model uh, lays out for us what part of these results are the investor's performance? Do they make good stock picks? Do they make good buy and sell decisions? And what part is that variation? And that's sort of the why, really, why you uh, in particular don't want to be uh, or certainly obsessing over your, your stock performance every day or even checking every day. And that's because the model will tell us what the noise to performance ratio is, right? What is that variation versus what is your actual performance? Again, on an annual basis, that's about 0 0.7 to 1. So you have about a 60-40 chance that if, if you pat yourself on the back because you've had a good year, or you grit your teeth or get stressed because you've had a bad year, that that's actually uh, on you. That, that those are um, causes that you can control and things you have to work on in the case of needing to improve. This, of course, deteriorates pretty rapidly, just like that uh, success rate deteriorates. Uh, we don't get every line in here. I'm just copying it from the book. Uh, on a monthly basis, now the noise over overcomes the performance, right? On a, on a monthly basis, 2.32 to 1, uh, just about a 2 to 1 ratio where it's more likely to be noise than it is your performance. Uh, you know, the, the Fed makes a choice. There's some geopolitical item. Uh, uh, there's some other economic news. Um, nothing to do with what your stock picks were, what your thesis was. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Nassim doesn't give us the day, but he does say for the hour, that actually gets down to 30 to 1. Now, this is nonlinear, and, and the second is, is uh, even more. So this is nonlinear, but I, I'm going to estimate, and I, I need to uh, take a note to do this myself. I'm going to say it's about a 10 to 1 ratio of noise to signal here. So um, reacting on a daily basis, even if it's just uh, getting upset at yourself or, or uh, being frustrated with a stock, is much more about reacting to the noise that's going on in the market around you than about any decision you made. And that can be a frustrating thing. So um, there is some hope uh, as we look at this. And that's because in the model, we looked at a symmetrical, uh, a symmetrical uh, bell curve, symmetrical bet, if you will. Uh, flip a coin, uh, bet me, you know, bet me a dollar, heads I win, tails you win. But that's not uh, what the market is, really. How much can you really lose on a stock? Now, we're not, we're not going to uh, uh, go down the path of, of leverage or uh, options or things like that. We just say, if you're simply buying a stock, of course, the most you can lose is 100%. And that rarely happens all at once. Uh, you know, you usually have several steps down on the way uh, where you could uh, uh, see the light of day and, and move on to greener pastures. But, uh, you know, most you can lose is 100%. How much can you gain on a stock? You know, that's uh, fun functionally uh, as close to infinity as you might think. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, things like Tesla or Meta or Google come to mind. Uh, but uh, take a look at Monster Beverages performance over, over the time period since 2000. It's actually gained more than them. Um, so there are any number of stocks that you can sort of hit home runs on or multiple home runs. And that impacts your overall performance quite greatly more than just this if you will uh, there's a baseball analogy you want your you want a high slugging percentage as opposed to just a batting a batting average so this is called skewness uh when 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 you talk to people with data right the payoffs and it happens to be fortunate for us skewness in our favor uh the the positive payoff is uh, better than the bet we make when we lose as long as we're doing our homework so here's a real life example. This is the Mid-Michigan Roundtable. Uh, four very excellent uh, investors in the BI community uh, and a number of people that helped them, including me, full disclosure. Um, they have uh, just rounded out their, uh, their 14th or yeah, their 14th year uh, in existence. They started in 2010. Um, this chart is their relative return compared to the Wilshire 5000. And you can see as they started out, uh, of course, when you start out, you kind of have zero, right? You're, you're just putting money in, nothing has happened. You have this variation um, at zero or below zero, and then they, they do reach a point of almost 4% in a high peak. Then after about five years, you can see this variation as sort of a second channel. Now, after five years, they don't really go much below 2% outperformance. 
Uh, they come close to 5%. They still have variation. And then finally, uh, just about year eight, they have what's in essence the current condition. Um, they do have a couple dips down uh, down to 4% outperformance, with, but this is a group of people in public demonstration making regular uh, picks uh, every month. Uh, each of the four nights of the round table makes a pick and they make a fifth pick into their uh, model portfolio based on the audience voting on, on which presentation they like most. Um, and they've managed 5% uh, outperformance uh, for now going on uh, six years and counting, and hopefully uh, this is e either a sustained item, uh, you can see it's longer in those initial phases, or maybe they'll find a way to improve too. So they've, they've, they are at a plus 5% relative return, and they've done this though uh, with an accuracy, meaning uh, selections that have outperformed the market, of 47.4%. So again, back to the skewness point. If they were if they were uh, saving for retirement by flipping coins, that wouldn't be good news. They would be losing slightly more than they're winning. But because you have the the uh, ability to outperform your losses, you can uh, achieve better investing goals. Now, there's one particular example that really puts this in in light. So one of the 780 selections that they have made over these 14 years is Microsoft. They actually have picked Microsoft five times um, with uh, $1,000 bets. Uh, that total from this five time selection is now worth, and this was actually as of July, uh, $89,857, just under $90,000. Uh, if you look at the second box here, 220 uh, of the uh, overall selections have actually lost money. So, so they're not zero. They're, it's not that they're underperforming the market. They, they've actually lost money a bit. Uh, the, the team has a good discipline to sell those if they lose a lot. They also have the good discipline not to be uh, worried if there is some initial variation when they, when they pick them. Uh, so they're not quick to sell, but they will sell uh, if things are underperforming. The loss for those 220 positions, loss of principal is $64,900. So this is a case where one selection followed over, and I, I don't remember uh, exactly when the first time they picked Microsoft, but it, it was not at the first year that they had it. Um, this, this one company that they've uh, invested and reinvested in uh, just five times has actually made up for all the losses in the whole portfolio. Now, again, there are another 48% uh, uh, of, of picks or, or probably 48.52% 48, 48 uh, of picks that also have made money that have contributed to that performance. But when they talk about whether there's risk investing in individual stocks, that is true if you're looking at them one at a time. When you look at them on a portfolio basis, it's quite easy to see big winners um, that, that sort of uh, bring, you, bring you along with all your mistakes combined. So you might say, uh, well, Matt, you said this was the psychology of investing. So far, you showed me the statistics of investing, and I don't like that bait and switch. So let's now that we have a little bit of a, of a grounding in how we recognize performance, let's talk about the psychology of following along in those uh, years of investing. So maybe we'll even start with a little philosophy. What makes you happy um, when we when we're trying to do this extra work beyond? indexing, uh, the reason you probably want to do it is to make yourself more happy, make your uh, life more comfortable, uh, uh, be able to provide for your family, all sorts of things. Um, but I'm talking even bigger than that. Uh, you know, maybe uh, you enjoy your work. Again, maybe you love your family, you love where you live. Um, those are the things that people would naturally cite. Uh, but a century of psychological resource, research says these sort of uh, objective circumstances only account for eight to 15% of the variance in your happiness. Um, people can be happy at a lot of different states uh, and it doesn't make sense if you're sort of counting up a score of what their life looks like. So what really makes people happy is comparatively how you're doing versus who you're talking to, right? And that leads to the, uh, the old saying, comparison is the thief of joy. Um, now, my first reaction in having these thoughts is maybe I should quit BI and I should go find some day traders because they probably don't do as good, right? Uh, there are a whole lot of successful investors around here. And I talk to a lot of them as I go to the, uh, the clubs in the Houston area. 
but uh, don't be afraid of that. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from these successful investors. So don't hold yourself to their example. I showed you how the round table is doing. Don't feel bad if you're not at 5%. They weren't at 5% either at some time ago too. Rather, uh, uh, thank your lucky stars that uh, we have them and they do a public demonstration so we can learn from how they work to, or we can learn from seeing them work to see what's sort of behind the scenes and try and pick that up and put that into application in our own investing lives. So this is, uh, this is actually the, the nutshell of what will probably be the next thing I talk about. Um, so in, in uh, psychological terms, uh, there is a, uh, a, a theory called prospect theory. It's a Nobel winning uh, prize winning theory for Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And they experimentally determined that humans feel uh, more pain than pleasure and actually quantified it. On average, it's about twice as much pain as pleasure. Uh, I put in the range, uh, different experiments measure that from 1.5 to 2.5 times, right? Uh, people are, are more or less risk averse than others. It's not a universal number, but it's actually amazingly uh, tight, uh, uh, tight range uh, that's determined. It can be very different from culture to culture, um, but within a culture it can be a pretty tight range. So this leads us to be risk averse by nature, right? This is why uh, we don't have uh, 330 million uh, individual stock investors in the US. Um, there are other reasons people, you know, go back to my three reasons. People may not enjoy it. People may not have the time, um, but a lot of people uh, have a lot of difficulty getting through those down market times without, uh, without selling out at the bottom, without realizing all those losses, uh, basically following their emotions instead of, instead of their, um, their intellect, their, their rational minds. So going back to the, the model, right? Checking, when we check things frequently, it puts our emotions to test more often, right? Uh, if, if I'm checking my stocks, my portfolio daily, not only do I have to uh, put at risk this, this pain versus pleasure threshold, but remember that only has about a 55% chance of, of uh, success. Uh, it fails at two to one ratio. Uh, if I'm looking at it on an annual basis uh, and I had a 93% chance of success, uh, that, that's uh, much more calming or much quieter to work on. Does that mean I'm forbidding you to check daily? No, you know yourself, you know what goes on. But if if you check your portfolio daily, you can't help yourself, but you have a, pit, a feeling in the pit of your stomach, uh, understand what, that that's something you're doing to yourself. Now I have on the right-hand side of here, I have a, a graphic of the upside downside ratio and the, and the different ranges from, and I just wanna uh, connect a point here. Um, this will just be a small part here, but uh, I think there's, there's quite, quite astonishing wisdom here too. Um, this is actually a representation of uh, the results of prospect theory. And uh, on the left, we have uh, the, the one third, one third, one third range, right? Buy, sell, and hold. And, under, and understand that uh, if we say we're going to buy in the buy range, we have given ourselves a, uh, a risk policy, I'll mention that later on, that we won't buy when we are not, uh, we won't buy until we're above that emotional break even. We expect that we will have pleasure out of this instead of pain going through here. Now, George Nicholson uh, sort of talks about both. He says, he says, only buy with a three to one upside downside ratio. And then he says, have these three regions, uh, one third, one third, one third. But here's the astounding point. Uh, Kahneman and Tversky first published prospect theory in 1979. Uh, you probably know what the next thing is uh, if you have enough experience in the organization. George Nicholson actually published this in 1952. I'm sure it was in use uh, uh, much uh, much before that, certainly in the organization, which was founded in 1951. But this, this predates the general understanding of the psychological impact by 25 years. Um, really interesting, and I have no idea. I'm, I'm intensely curious how much this may have been his intuition or experience or something in, in, uh, in his peers that was sort of a, 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 known, a known aphorism or something, um, but really a powerful tool in our toolbox that has been proven scientifically later on. So there's another thing to, to keep in mind as you're looking at your performance and that's self-serving bias. 
we have a predictable pattern in how we feel the outcomes, how we look back at the performance and judge ourselves. We tend to take credit for the good stuff and blame bad stuff on luck. And we do that so that it won't be our fault to help us have a positive impact on ourselves. I am a good investor, or I am at least uh, working hard at this to understand investing. And that way we are predictably irrational. Um, it's, a, it's a repeated thing that sort of, uh, that, that deviates from what a truly logical uh, being would be. Um, and in fact, the, the more insidious part of this is, is we will seek out a plausible reason for the outcome which fits our wishes. So when we're going back and we're thinking, well, what really happened? If we find something that, some story that may have explained how it happened while also not taking the blame for bad stuff, we will uh, tend to gravitate toward that unless we guard against it um, and and uh, let it be just, just again, to be happy as opposed to learn from our outcome. Uh, as I say, this, this behavior prevents us from learning from our experience. Uh, Annie quotes in the book, the predictable feeling error is probably the most significant problem for poker players. And I add, it's for investors too. If, if you don't truly understand and can learn from your errors, you will never have that improvement, which shows up in that slight edge uh, time and time again. The funny thing is, when we look at others, the bias reverses. So we tend to look at others. Remember, our happiness comes from comparative, uh, comparative, our comparative view of others. So we, when we think of them and we think of success as all or nothing, we tend to blame them for bad outcomes. Well, they got what they deserved or, and fail to give them credit for good outcomes. Well, they were just lucky, right? And so I have a picture here of a minivan cutting off the driver. Uh, you know, what do you think they do? And, there, and it's pretty heavy traffic. What do you think is the reaction of the driver, right? You know, honk your horn. I uh, can't believe that person just did that. Uh, you know, why did they, why did they want to cut me off? Probably not considering that maybe they're a new parent with a, a an upset infant in the back or that their navigation system uh, just rerouted them to turn left. You know, uh, people make, all people make mistakes. People do other times, but there's a symmetry in how we look at things and we can actually take use of that. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit later on uh, how to uh, put that to use when we're looking at ourselves. So here's a graphical view. If you're looking to uh, understand, let's say you had a, a stock pick that, that didn't turn out well, or maybe it did. Uh, on the vertical axis, we have our decision quality, right? Did we follow our process? Did we do an SSG? Did we research, uh, uh, whether it's Value Line, Morningstar, your, your trusted advisors to see what they say? Um, did you do anything that, that you're supposed to do? Okay, if so, then, then it's a good one. If, if you uh, speculated, if you dabbled in, uh, in technical measures, you know, whatever else you're doing that you're not good at yet, that's, that's probably a bad decision. And then we have the outcome quality. So sometimes that works out for us, sometimes it doesn't. If we were a fully rational creature, we would have four sort of views of this outcome. If we had a good decision quality and we had a good outcome, that's an earned reward. The, the process works, uh, uh, the method works, we're happy to share those, uh, uh, the fruits of that labor with our family. We're happy to tell others about it. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes there's a pan, you, know, you, you invest in something in 2019 and there's a pandemic. Um, so you have bad luck, something not foreseeable, um, not something that you could have known ahead of time and it's just bad luck. Then the other way around, we should understand if we, if we speculate, if we try something different and it works out, that is at least in part some dumb luck. Uh, you know, you talk about beginner's luck, a lot of, a lot of words for it, um, to realize that uh, it wasn't all on us. Now, again, particularly when looking at other people, if you have a bad process, you had a bad outcome, that's kind of your just desserts. If, if you know better, why did you do that? Uh, and maybe that's a, a life lesson to, uh, to help put you back on track. Now, let's look at that, at this group through a number of biases. When we look at things with hindsight, we tend to ignore the, the role of luck. This is what happened. So this is what always was supposed to happen. And of course, uh, any athlete, uh, any professional can, can tell you that's not really true, right? There, there are uh, numerous small decisions that could uh, make the difference in the outcome of, of any sort of uh, contest. 
uh, the, the week one of the NFL, there was there was a, a, a game winning touchdown that was called back by by one big toe. The 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 line that I like best that talked about it was if if the receiver had had one shoe size less, they would have won. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's that's how it goes. Uh, it was a great play. He made the catch. It just didn't work. But we tend to be fatalistic if we only start to think about our results afterward. So this is an important part, particularly when you are following uh, your your uh, process and your good decision. Think about the the after effects as you're starting. I'm going to invest in the stock. What would it look like if the stock does is successful? What would it look like if it isn't successful? That priming of the fact that multiple things could happen will help you look back on your results uh, with with clearer eyes. Now, with a self-serving bias, like I said, we tend to just keep the, the top row. Of course, we have good decision quality. We, we are us and we're good. Um, we we uh, don't like to admit we make mistakes. So we only look at the top level, right? If we, if we have a good outcome, we earn the reward. If it was a bad outcome, it was just bad luck. Uh, you know, you're not going to win them all. Just move on. This, again, uh, limits our ability to learn from these bad outcomes uh, and blinds us to improving our, our game, our investment ability. Like I said, when we look for others, it's the opposite, right? We never give them credit. If, if you had something happen, it was dumb luck because we want to feel, and this is, this is no uh, indictment of, of you or, or uh, uh, your internal thought process. This is a natural process of your subconscious. Um, but if they, if they had something bad, you have, uh, if there's a thing called schadenfreude. Uh, you you uh, sort of look at it and say, you know, well, they just shouldn't have, uh, have tried to do something with a, with a bad uh, decision process. So how do you synthesize these? What do you take away from that? The way to address this is to change your self-serving habit from being right, from absolutely being right or being wrong to learning and improving. Don't compete with others, compete with yourself from the past. And the nice thing about that is yourself from the past, meaning the, the person who actually makes that investment decision can help the future you uh, by following your processes and by, uh, by leaving some clues about what was going on in your mind so you don't forget them, right? So this, instead of, instead of being handicapped by our tendency for self-esteem, we leverage our, our uh, desire for self-esteem and how we compare to our peers. You can learn faster than someone else, and they'll say that's a, that's a valid thing to think about. Um, you can enjoy doing something that's hard, right? Uh, anyone can do this, but not everyone does it. Um, it is uh, relatively rare. Uh, it's, it's one of the largest organizations that, that uh, is involved in investing, certainly as a nonprofit. Um, but uh, uh, revel in having this community to learn from and to experience with and improve yourself. Uh, there's a, a quote uh, from Thinking in Bets from Annie that says, people with the most legitimate claim to a bulletproof self-narrative have developed habits around accurate self-critique, right? Uh, only with your eyes open can you then improve, particularly when you actually have high performance, um, and then uh, do better the next time. And you can do this in part by taking the perspective of someone else, right? Um, you might do that figuratively if you can, if you can uh, uh, make a parable of the uh, of the dentist investor and he made the same decisions you did, what would you view of them? You can also literally do this. This is one of the big takeaways from thinking in bets. Um, basically, Annie endorses the idea of investment clubs, right? Uh, there are people that certainly you uh, hold in esteem enough to commingle money with. Um, you meet with them regularly and take the opportunity to um, not only uh, review the investments of the club with that, but uh, maybe chat some of them up if you've had if you've had something not work out, see what they think. If that was a mistake or if that was luck. Finally, to close, and there's so many athletic uh, quotes from this, but this is Mia Hamm, um, leader of uh, of the women's uh, national soccer team. Right? Many people say I'm the best women's soccer player in the world. I don't think so, and because of that, someday I might just be. Um, certainly, again, when you're among the best of the best, uh, there there aren't a lot of books to read or other people to learn from. Um, you are at the at the cutting edge in trying to improve yourself. Another uh, uh, technique that can improve your results is how you frame the problem. Um, so, uh, if you think back, if you think back to that uh, simulation, um, when you look at things daily, or if you look at an individual stock, you have a narrow framing. 
And again, our uh, psychology wants us always to win, to have a positive self-interest. So if we uh, make a judgment stock by stock at a time without putting it in context, without understanding if it was luck or skill, um, we will end up making a number of mistakes. So the kinds of mistakes we can make, uh, one is called the disposition effect. Uh, people probably know it better as cutting the flowers and watering the weeds, right? If, if you need to sell something, um, it's, it's very difficult to sell something that is losing money, even though obviously it's lost money. It's clearly underperformed because the market has moved on. Um, we want to uh, take a win and harvest that great result, but, but honestly, that may, uh, may damage our portfolio even as we harvest that gain. There's also the sunk cost fallacy, uh, the idea of getting back to even, right? I'll sell it when I get back to even. The market doesn't care what your purchase price was. Uh, only you do. So if you are stuck on a, on a fact of your, what your buy price is before you sell, you're in a psychological match with yourself. Um, the possibility effect and certainty effect. Um, the possibility effect is sort of how lotteries work. So when things go from impossible to uh, very, very, uh, uh, very small chances, you know, I have a one in 290 million percent chance of winning $100 million. Uh, lotteries work, even though it's a negative uh, expected payout. The certainty effect is the other side of that. That's how insurance works, right? When you have a 95% chance of losing uh, $750 or $1,000 and a, or let's say $750 and a 100% chance of losing $750, people want to take that bet. Uh, and so people in effect buy insurance to try and ride it out as opposed to take a loss that might be uh, better for them long-term, but is psychologically hard to do. And then simply regret. Uh, no fancy words there. Um, it's much easier to go through and process your losses as learning rather than just simply as a decision that sits out there and, and eats at you whenever you see uh, future quotes of that of that stock or uh, brought up the story of a bankruptcy, something like that. So uh, I encourage you to use the proper frame and it, it would be a, the broadest frame you can when you reflect on your performance. Uh, so don't use the narrow frame, use the broad frame. Look at your portfolio rather than any single stock. Um, check the prices uh, as infrequently as needed. You know, if you're buying some stock, you need to check what the price is to see how it is. But obsessively checking prices daily is not just uh, a bad habit because it takes up time. It actually uh, does some psychological damage to you without if it doesn't have a purpose. Um, again, uh, don't sell your winners. Sell to make your portfolio stronger. Um, all sale, all selling decisions should be made on a portfolio basis as much as it, as it is on a stock basis. Uh, and then avoid the possibility effect and certainty effect. Follow a consistent risk process policy. You have the makings of the core of a risk policy in the upside downside ratio. Uh, something easy to follow, something built in the SSG. You may have other things. You know, a lot of people uh, will also follow not to have more than 30% uh, debt to capital, um, not to have a PE over 30. There are all sorts of little things um, that people follow as a risk policy. Maybe you don't write them down or put them together. That would be a good idea. Uh, and then when you are looking to violate that, you have sort of a, an artifact staring you in the face saying, that might not be a good idea for you because we do vary. The other thing to do is engage what Kahneman calls system two, your conscious mind. And that's, that, that's uh, his, his book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. All these subconscious things are immediate effects. And the, the, the big presentation goes into that extensively. Um, but we uh, talk about uh, uh, how we get immediate impressions and, and call it intuition, uh, call it uh, sort of an initial judgment, a first, a first blush. Um, those can lead us astray in something that's as, as uh, abstract as stock investing. So make sure you are thinking about your decisions when you go through. You don't just act on emotion or on an instinct. Um, the thing is, is it'll be hard, especially at first. If, if that's the way you've worked, if you're a day trader, a recovering day trader investing like we do, <coughs> you might wonder uh, if how can we be successful thinking that slowly? But in fact, it's that slow thinking that makes you successful. Follow your discipline and your tools, right? Complete your SSG every time. Do your research. And I, I say Value Line and Morningstar, they're so common, but use, use whatever resources you find work for you. Hold you in check <coughs> when you have a crazy idea and uh, confirm what you think uh, when you have a good idea. 
Uh, highly suggest that you use an investing checklist. There are a few great examples in the community. Uh, Kim Butcher uh, does a regular presentation on checklists, but make your own. Again, uh, the, the things that help you sleep at night, the things that are learnings from where you've made mistakes in the past. I would also suggest that uh, there's a note section on SSG on the online tool, write down your investment thesis, right? If I had an investment thesis in the year 2000 that said, I'm investing in Intel because it's the premier chip manufacturer in the world, uh, then these days I would have, that would call into, into uh, conflict, right? Even if I excuse the numbers, they'll turn it around, you know, uh, things are changing. Um, I'll, I'll, th that thesis will stare me in the face and say, that's not true right now. That doesn't make it an immediate sell. That means you need to go back and think of it as you would a new stock and say, would I buy this uh, large turnaround company with whatever opportunities it has? <laughs> and of course, uh, we our process is not the only process to follow investing. Um, whatever you find, uh, whatever you find useful, use it consistently and uh, and document it so that you know in times of stress. Uh, like March of 2020, you you go back to those tools and rely on them to make good decisions. And again, get an outside opinion. That can be uh, thinking if you if you can, if you have that uh, get good an imagination, uh, what someone else would say to you, or quite literally, uh, either either a good friend that invests to, or ideally an investment club. So in summary. Um, in the in the real world, small advantages compound long term performance. That's how it gets measured, uh, and you have to take that in mind when you're judging yourself and your performance. Um, measure that performance objectively to get a clear view. I didn't talk uh, about what the right benchmark is. Um, you know, the S and P five hundred is certainly the most uh, the the most often used and the easiest to find. Maybe that matches your investing style. Maybe it doesn't. But if you do use one, stick with that. Because uh, if you move the benchmark too much, it won't give you a, uh, a useful signal. Again, use a broad time frame to avoid loss aversion. Um, you can you can uh, lose a battle and still win the war. Um, comparing yourselves to the best may lead to discouragement. You know, if you're not outperforming by five percent in the last decade, that doesn't mean you should give up and and uh, and ask the investing roundtable to manage your money. Instead. Um, attend their sessions again they, they leave them in open and see what you can learn from them ask questions uh, they're very open to questions even as they give presentations not just about the companies they cover but ask them questions about their process that is that is a great sort of live learning environment that uh, you can pull away and make your own investing better so uh, again uh, i've, I've uh, beat the dead horse now uh, focus on your process gives you your small advantage if you're if you're just a day trader, if you're just uh, going on instinct, um, you're you're just a, a person. You might as well be in the casino. You're just a person, uh, sort of trapped by your subconscious. The process is is exactly the tools that uh, let us win in a long term investing. So that is everything. Uh, are there any questions? I don't know uh, if if uh, convention is to speak or talk. I have the chat window open. If someone wants to chat instead of speak it out. I'm going to take a drink. As as fall approaches, then uh, my apparently my mortal enemy, the elm tree, is uh, is at its height. So my voice is at its <laughs> limits about now. Thank you. I think uh, I think uh, everybody is open to um, unmute themselves and join the discussion as needed. I will also say I just snuck this in uh, bibliography. Um, really, it's the top four books here that, that I referenced uh, materials in this presentation. Uh, the other five I also picked out from uh, for the, the, the larger presentation that went out to. I'll say my, my forward reading list is about twice as big. <laughs> so it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a side hobby, but uh, I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Yes, is the presentation slides available? So what we normally do is upload the slides uh, to the website uh, for the chapter uh, in a day or two.
All right. Well, I guess that's it. I, I hope you're all stunned and deep in thought as opposed to uh, uh, watching uh, whatever's on TV now. No, I think it's a very good presentation, Matt. I think uh, the challenge is, again, we make a lot of investment decisions based on emotions rather than logical and practical thinking, you know? And I think this is where, like some of the points you pointed out, it's a long-term goal, looking at a bigger picture of the portfolio than a, than individual stock or being worried about it on a daily basis. Those are the things that that really um, that really help. Yep, and, and keep in mind, even even the best we have, and, and I say the round table is the best, right? This is Ken Gavula. This is our chairman, Cy Lynch. Uh, this is Mark Robertson of Manifest Investing. And um, bleh, I'm forgetting who it is. Um, but, you know, these, these are these are the best guys we have. And, you know, even they starting off. And it isn't to say that, that this is all about them getting better. Some of it is that their ideas take time, right? Uh, Microsoft certainly had a fallow decade uh, after, its de after its dominance in desktops. Uh, they sort of uh, miss the boat on mobile uh, and, and have only come back into their own uh, for cloud computing. Um, so, you know, uh, these decisions take time. This is not about, you know, the, the technical wiggles of, of individual stocks. This is about how companies evolve. Um, so, so give yourself some grace that you go through. Um, and, you know, but, but you're, you're the only judge that matters because you're driving your money. Um, so it's the best you can do to be honest with yourself will give you the best shot at actually making these performance goals. Matt, I'm just, I'm just curious, sir. Are you a tennis player? No. Oh. <laughs> Have I played tennis in the past? I, I'm six, eight. So you can, you can guess what my family's uh, sports. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very good uh, presentation. H hard to um, argue with any of this, and I don't. I don't have a ready question now, but uh, certainly a lot to think about here. Thank you. Fair enough. I like I said, I do hope to sort of propagate uh, through here um, the uh, that analogy, or not analogy, but the uh, the part about uh, the upside downside ratio. I'm thinking about taking maybe to a ticker talk. Uh, I've been invited to uh, the four bits, which is actually going on right now, which is the volunteers uh, occasional uh, education. So hopefully, hopefully as these pieces come together, um, we can start making this more of a conversation about how things go as opposed to sort of uh, an introduction. Yep. Another powerful tool in your tool belt. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. And we also normally now open it up to any questions that people have that might not have anything to do with Matt's presentation. But if you're just getting started investing or you're just getting started with SSG or you're a long-term investor that just has come up with a question that you'd like to hear some group wisdom on, we invite you to bring that up at this time. It's a quiet crowd tonight, Chris. It is. Everybody's shy today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And at this time, we are going to close off the meeting. But as everybody mentioned, as we mentioned, we are going to be making the slides available once Matt emails them to me. Uh, they'll probably be up in the next couple of days on our website, along with the video. And we also have a YouTube channel, if you haven't checked it out yet, please do, where we put up all of our past presentations. And there's some great wisdom there. So thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, everybody. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.